As we enter the final 24 hours of the campaign, the opinion polls universally have Labor in a losing position and the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd is under intense pressure. Labor's campaign has been largely built around the coalition's economic credibility and the government's claim that Tony Abbott is hiding plans for massive spending cuts. So the release of the coalition costings today was a make or break moment for both parties. The Prime Minister is in Western Sydney tonight from where he joined me a short time ago. Prime Minister, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me on the program, Lee. Today, have your five weeks of scaremongering over coalition costings come to naught? I think if you look carefully at the statement by uh, Mr Abbott and Mr Hockey and Mr Rob today, it's very plain that here we are 24 hours before an election and we have no comprehensive list at all of their cuts, their massive cuts to jobs, health and education. And in fact, we have no detail at all as required under the Charter of Budget Honesty. So I believe the Australian people go into a poll in 24 hours time legitimately concerned about how these cuts will impact their lives, their jobs, their schools, their hospitals. But Prime Minister, how can we trust what you say on opposition costings when last week the two most senior economic bureaucrats in the country called you out for misleading voters on the subject? Uh, well, with respect, I'd draw your attention to what was actually contained within that statement. And furthermore, if I could add to that by saying uh, that uh, in the press conference on that particular day, I specifically and directly challenged Mr Abbott to tell us where we were wrong in any of the tables that we circulated that day. That was my challenge to him, directly on the record on that day. But you but Mr. and Abbott's two ministers... Since then, sorry, if we can just stay on that statement. You and two ministers released apparent costings of opposition policies by the Treasury and then the heads of Treasury and Finance released a statement saying they had not costed opposition policies clearly because they felt Labor was using their departments inappropriately. How has that not put a big hole in your credibility on this subject? Well, the bottom line is, uh, Lee, I draw your attention to what the Treasurer said that day about the fact that different assumptions underpinning policies resulted in different conclusions. He said that explicitly. And furthermore, on the record, what I said about the tables we'd circulated that day uh, was that Mr Abbott please come and tell us uh, where any of these calculations are wrong. And that was a very explicit challenge to him. He failed to do so. And here we are. He's been leader of the Liberal Party for, uh, what, uh, four years now. We've had a five-week election campaign, virtually 24 hours before the polls open, and the entire nation is effectively in the dark where his comprehensive list of cuts to jobs health and education will fall. And just on the latter point, Lee, we've had this extraordinary twist today where Mr Abbott said, look, health and education are off the agenda. Uh, but then again, when asked directly what his commission of audit post-election, if he wins, would do, he said everything's on the table, every portfolio. I've just got to say, they make this up as they go along because their objective is, once you get to polling day, for the entire country to be in the dark about where these cuts will hit them, their jobs, and frankly, if they're big enough, hit the overall health of the economy and risk the reality of a recession. From the moment the election was called, you've based a large part of your campaign against the coalition on their alleged economic black hole and fears of massive spending cuts. You've repeatedly cited a $70 billion figure for which there's no evidence. You've produced apparent costings by Treasury that Treasury distanced itself from. We've seen the document today that over the forward estimates does not have any evidence of cuts to health and education. You've been caught out overreaching, haven't you? Well, can I just go to one point you've just made? And that goes to cuts to education. Uh, we have a better schools plan to invest in our schools on a needs-based uh, needs funding formula uh, right through to 2019. Uh, we are committing $10 billion towards that. Uh, Mr Abbott is barely committing $2 billion to that. And that is in effect an $8 billion cut. We talk about education. In his list today, in terms of the education expenses faced by parents across the country, he explicitly owns up to the fact that he is giving a $4.5 billion cut to the school kids bonus to help parents, 1.3 million of them, buy uniforms and books through that cheque which arrives twice a year. But Prime Minister, so on the question of education cuts, reached. that's just wrong. You've not addressed no, my that's point. that's exactly not the point. No, the point is you said no cuts to education in the list that he's produced. 
I produced for you two examples where that is simply not the case. But you're claiming there are further secret cuts. You're claiming there are further secret cuts to education out there for which you have no evidence. Oh, but Lee, uh, it is very plain from the public record what Mr Abbott has said. He has said that he would provide funding for an initial set of years only for the Better Schools Plan. The Better Schools Plan, which is massive for all the people watching your program, increases in their school budgets over time so kids get more one-on-one -on -one attention. That goes out for a period through until 2019 and that's the basis upon which the Catholic system signed up, the basis on which the independent school system signed up, the basis on which a whole bunch of other state jurisdictions have signed up. And what he has done is not promise $10 million or commit to that as we have, he's committed $2 billion. That's an $8 billion gap in education. That's a fact, that's not an assertion. But the reality is that anything outside the forward estimates is basically pie in the sky. There's no way for you to be held accountable to it. There's no way of testing whether that would actually ever happen or not. Uh, Lee, that's wrong again. We've signed an intergovernmental agreement with a number of states in the country which go well beyond the Ford estimates in a whole range of different areas. And the same with this one as well. Same with the Catholics and same with the independent schools. So you cannot simply say, we're just going to give you $2 billion worth and kiss the rest goodbye. And on the other education example I've just given you, a whole bunch of folks watching this program tonight are under cost of living pressures. They appreciate a cheque twice a year which gives them $1,200 or thereabouts if they've got a kid in primary school or high school and over the course of their education some $15,000 to help with books, to help with uniforms and education expenses. That's a cut to education. Prime Minister, critics have claimed that your campaign has at times looked like fly by the seat of the pants. One of the policies that you've announced in recent weeks is a move to relocate Australia's main east coast naval base from Garden Island in Sydney to Brisbane. When was that policy devised? Well, the first thing you should look at, uh, Lee, in terms of uh, this policy was the uh, report delivered by the Defence Force uh, Structure uh, Review back in 2012. I have looked at that. And it was only written was by the 2013 Defence White Paper. Uh, the Defence White Paper indicated they would not commit to it at this time. And furthermore, to, as to the specific process un, uh, which goes to uh, the policy position we've put there, there on Fleet Based East, uh, that went to Cabinet, by the way, uh, prior to uh, the caretaker period commencing. So the assumptions underpinning the criticism on this are frankly all founded. Then you go to the strategic reasons for Fleet Base East, Fleet Base East moving. Number one, we're getting massive new ships into the Australian Navy. They can't will be accommodated at Garden Island. Number two, uh, all of our defence scenarios in the future point to the northeast, the north and the northwest, and therefore, based on earlier advice from the Defence Force Posture Review, it is right to, in fact, go in there and look at how we now do, through a naval task force, uh, possible basing options for Brisbane, for Townsville, for Cairns, for Darwin, for Perth, for these elements. That's the logic of it. It's been considered uh, through the processes I've just outlined. But the all criticism is unfounded. All the points you raised, though, the Defence White Paper did address. They found that Garden Island is extremely useful and needs to remain, that you could use Brisbane as a supplement, but that it rejected moving everything to Brisbane because of a range of factors, including cost, land acquisition, environmental factors, strategic and, and tactical factors, such as Sydney has a deep harbour with access straight to the Pacific Ocean. Given that the Defence White Paper is meant to form the basis for the government's defence policy, can you see how overriding that looks like something you've done not because of the uh, best interests of the nation's security, but in order to uh, win votes in Brisbane marginal seats? Uh, that's completely wrong because the document which examines the future disposition of our force structure is the Defence Force pu uh, the Defence for Structure Review of 2012. And on the second point, Lee, there's a factual error in what you've just said. Uh, we have not said that every element of Fleet Pace East would move from Garden Island North. What we've said is that a naval task force will recommend what elements remain and what goes north, uh, whether it be to Brisbane or whether it's to Townsville, whether it's to Cairns, Darwin or even west to HMAS Stirling. You see, what I find interesting in this whole debate, Lee, is that on defence, 
and planning for the future, which is what the business of national leadership is about, not just looking at the next 24 hours. When Kim Beasley suggested a decade or two ago that we should have a fleet base west, HMA is sterling, there was a hullabaloo that this could never ever be done. It's the smartest thing that was done because we have so many defence contingencies to our west, our north and our northeast, and that's why this is the right thing to do, but through the advice of a naval task force, which the policy document released the other day, places our faith and confidence in. Prime Minister, on another policy area, the Northern Australian Economic Zone Plan proposes simplifying mm. foreign investment, but then in a TV forum you said that you wanted to tighten up foreign investment rules. You've said you wanted to build the economy of the future, but then you've announced old-fashioned protectionism of the car industry. Can you see how those contradictions give rise to a perception that you are making up policy on the run? No, that's just uh, a lot of conservative commentary at pointing in that direction, when in fact what we are doing as a government, based on consultation with the Cabinet and the leadership group of our government, pointing out future policy directions which are necessary for Australia for the long term. Uh, for example, uh, some have criticised uh, the um, heretical proposition that the Deputy Prime Minister should consider reserving a corridor for a future VFT link. And that's based on a detailed report done by um, an expert committee which reported to him uh, in July, August this year. Number two, we've already talked about the move of fleet-based east and the basis on which that occurred. And three, the expansion of the Ord right up there in the north. We've done that because we've already invested in stage two of the Ord and we want to prepare for stage three. And for the Northern Territory, my argument's pretty simple. Darwin is isolated. Darwin needs some help. It's a territory, it's not a state. And therefore, it's an important way in which you can attract foreign investment into the territory, attract further domestic investment into the territory, because we want a strong Northern Territory, which one day can become a state. I make no apology for making long-term uh, strategic um, decisions, recommendations, announcements on policy directions. Other than that, Lee, we're into day-to-day, day-by-day, week-by-week, retail political management, and I'm not about that. The NBN wasn't about that either. Long-term plan which will produce great benefits for all Australians. Prime Minister, we, in, in 48 hours the polls will be closed. All the polls at this stage show that Labor is going to lose the election. You've gone backwards in the campaign. Is your strategy at this stage simply to save as many seats as you can? Uh, Lee, my responsibility as leader of the Labor Party and as Prime Minister of the country is to explain very plainly what we stand for in building Australia's future and also campaigning on the strength of our economic record. We've had six years of sustained economic growth. Uh, we have unemployment. Uh, at uh, one of the lowest levels of the advanced economies in the world. We have interest rates at 60-year record lows. These are fundamental economic achievements which form the basis of our request to the Australian government, a, a request by the Australian government to the people for support of this upcoming election. But it doesn't look like they're and going the to deliver that, Prime Minister. Well, um, Lee, I think uh, people may be scratching their heads a bit during the course of Saturday because the Australian people, in my judgment, uh, move to these conclusions as you get uh, to the eve of Election Day itself, and it's for them to decide, and I'm very relaxed in their judgment. But at the end of the day, an election is about alternatives. I've just explained what we're doing on the economy and how we're doing it and how we're diversifying the economy. And the alternative is Mr Abbott. And Mr Abbott, I argue, if people out there watching your program have doubts about whether he can be trusted to manage a $1.5 trillion economy and not cut their jobs and not cut their schools and not cut their hospitals and not cut their NBM, then if they're the doubts they have, then I simply say one thing to them, they shouldn't vote for him. Prime Minister, people see how things are going and Australians like plain talk, so let me just ask very plainly, if you lose this election, is your political career over? Well, what I've uh, said uh, earlier today and elsewhere is that my intention uh, is to uh, continue as the member for Griffith and my intention is to continue as the member for Griffith as the Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, this is a contest between two sets of ideas, between two sets of plans for building Australia's future. Ours is a positive plan. Our opponents uh, only seem to talk about cuts, cuts and more cuts. And therefore the choice is theirs. What happens let beyond that? I'm very, I'm very relaxed about what the Australian people decide. But if well, you expect me to engage in hypothetical land now, Lee, I just won't do it. That's not my responsibility. Well, let me ask you about something that I think a lot of Labor supporters would want to know, which is that 
If you do lose the election, you say you'd like to continue as the member for, Grip for Griffith, don't you owe it to the Australian Labor Party to allow them to draw a clean line under the Rudd Gillard era and move to something new? Uh, my job, uh, Lee, is to put to the best case to the people of Australia listening to your program tonight about the policies on offer in this election. We began with a discussion about um, what we have done by way of adhering to the Charter of Bu Budget Honesty. And we had some discussion about the fact that with 24 hours to go, Mr Abbott has not adhered to the Charter of Budget Honesty. Do you think that and Australians... therefore, everyone's in the dark. Do you think that Australians but, would believe that you haven't given a second's thought to losing? Uh, can I just say, Lee, the job of... Uh, it's not for me to tell you what your job is. You're a journalist. You'll ask whatever question you like. But understand what my job is, which is to explain to people what the differences are, what we stand for, what our record is, and what we understand Mr Abbott's plans to be based on the little information that we have. And how the Australian people then respond to that is a matter for them. And as I've said before, I'm very confident in their judgment because ultimately they see through all of this, they work out whether you're fair dinkum or not, and they work out whether they in fact could trust Mr Abbott to handle the economy, handle the Syria questions you discussed with him the other night, where he didn't seem to know the difference between Arthur or Martha in the Syrian um, National Coalition, whether he can handle our responsibilities on the UN Security Council, whether he could represent Australia at the G20 and not slash and burn our schools and hospitals and our NBN on the way through. So, my argument is, as Prime Minister, my job is to put that case. Well, on that, How your let viewers me, let respond me... to it no, sorry, I, I didn't mean matter to, for them. Sorry. Um, on that point of wanting to make your case, when Mr Abbott came on the program on Monday night, you would have seen him at the end of the interview after I thanked him for coming on. He snuck in a 15-second plug as to why people should vote for the <laughs> Liberal Party. Oh, well, so, well, good on him. Good well, on in, him. In, in the interest of balance, you've got a 15-second free kick. Go. <laughs> Well, thanks very much. Look, uh, our plans are to build the economy of the future by diversifying and not having all our eggs in one basket. And we've, we're proposing that through a new tax package for small business and by new industry participation and innovation plans right across the country in the new industries of the future. And if you want broadband in the future, uh, we need your support because Mr Abbott's going to cut it. If you want further funding for your schools in the future through the Better Schools Plan, I you need to support us because Mr Abbott's going to cut it. I think you're and 15 finally, seconds. If you, if, if you want hospitals of the future, which are properly funded, and a clean energy future, you'd better support us because you're going to cut them too. If you've got Minister, any doubts, don't vote for him. Prime Minister, like Mr Abbott, you agreed to two interviews during the campaign and you've delivered both. Knowing how busy you are, thank you very much for that. Thank you for speaking to our audience. Thanks for having me on the program, Lee. And that's the program for tonight. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with a special national 7.30 election eve program with key political players and pundits to bring you all their 11th hour insights. I hope you can join me then. Good night.